Okay, we'd like to welcome you to our current event and weekly Bible study for February 17th, 2008. And today we're going to be discussing a subject that's going to really ruffle some feathers, most likely. And um, I would have to preface this by saying, you know, he that judgeth a matter before he heareth it, it is a folly and a shame unto him. Proverbs 18, verse 13. So, um, before you come to any judgments, I would say, hear this information out. And this information that I'm going to be presenting today is not really um, my opinion. It's from a lot of other people. Uh, we're going to be using a lot of direct quotes from people out of their own writings. We're going to be um, looking at uh, Alexander Hislop, the Two Babylons book. We're going to be looking at some really just factual evidence here. And the title would be, in a nutshell, The Cross. Symbol, the cross symbol, is it Christian or is it pagan? So let's let's look at that. And I'm, I'm talking the regular cross here. Now we're going we're gonna to go through and we're going to distinguish things. We're going to look at this from a lot of different angles. Uh, this is probably going to be a pretty long teaching because I felt like it had to be in order to address this subject. I didn't want to do this as a brief teaching and just kind of move on to the next thing. Now, the first little article writing I'm going to be quoting from is um, a study by Timothy Youngblood. And he goes on to this. It's just a few paragraphs here. But he says, the first crucifixion scenes didn't appear in Christian art until the 7th century by the Catholic Church. Did you know that? These crucifixion scenes, they didn't even appear in Christian art until the 7th century by the Catholic Church. But, the depicted body of Jesus was not shown at this time. The original cross symbol was in the form of what they call a Tau cross. T-A-U is how you spell that Tau cross. As shown, uh, they have a whole bunch of pictures in this particular article. And it was so named because it looked like the letter Tau, or our letter T. Now this would just be like if you drive by a uh, gas station, a Texaco gas station. It has a T on there. That's called a Tau cross. Okay? There's different kinds of crosses. There's all kinds of different kinds of crosses. And we're going to be looking at that today as well. Now one author states that the Catholic Church copied the symbol from the pagan Druids, who made crosses in this form to represent the Tau God. Now, we already know if you've been listening to these teachings, that much of what we have in Christianity today, modern day pseudo-Christianity, is because the Catholic Church brought it to us circa 318, when Constantine essentially took over this whole thing and started amalgamating pure paganism um, in Christianity together. This is how we have all of our holidays like, you know, Xmas, you know, and Easter, Ishtar, and all these other amalgamated pagan holidays. Uh, all of these Catholic traditions, um, we've went over the fact that, you know, the, the, the Jesus that they depict upon um, the Catholic Church has always depicted us this long-haired Jesus. Um, it's not biblically accurate. We've done all kinds of teachings on this, so this should really come as no surprise to us. Um, but it's going to shock a lot of people, and that's why I want to do a really uh, in-depth study on this. Now, um, when the Catholic Church copied the Tau cross from the pagan Druids. This was done so that those who worship the pagan god Tau would come into the Catholic Church. This is exactly why they did all of this. They were trying to appeal to Catholics in, or, or pagans and Christians at the same time. Now the Tau cross later became associated with Saint Philip who was allegedly crucified on a cross in Pythagoras. May Day, which is a major Druidic seasonal day of celebration, actually one of the main ones. It's one of the top three, I know. That's May 1st. Uh, that became St. Philip's Day by the Catholic Church. Later in Catholic Church history, the Tau Cross became the Roman Cross that we are familiar with today. The pre-Christian history of the Cross. The truth is that the Cross has been used as a religious symbol and an ornament from the dawn of man's civilization. Various objects dating from periods long before the Christian era have been found with different crosses of different designs in almost every part of the world. Did you know that? Crosses have been found from predating the Christian era from all parts of the world. They've been found for centuries. Centuries. And yet we think that it's this 
purely Christian thing, and it's been it's predated Christianity though. So who was doing who was using this before then? Well, it wasn't the, the the let's say the religious Jews. That's for sure. Um, the cross symbol was found in Scandinavia. The trout the Tau cross in that region symbolized the hammer of the god Thor. You ever heard of Thor? Okay, well that's what they used as their uh, the Tau cross as. In Hinduism, the vertical shaft represented the higher celestial states of being, whereas the horizontal bar represents the lower earthly states. That's in Hinduism. Uh, now they then they say um, the cross above is an Ankh and it's from Egypt. Okay, so an Ankh is a cross, it's like a Tau cross, a T cross, with a up with an inverted teardrop at the top. It's it's like a cross with an open symbol, an open uh, teardrop on the top. That's called an Ankh. Okay, and that's more of an Egyptian cross. Okay, and that cross is associated with um, the goddess M A A T Mat, the goddess of truth, it should be the goddess of lies. And what that cross represents is actually the sexual union of Isis and Osiris. Okay, that's what the Ankh represents. Okay, just like the, the square and compass represent sexual union in the Freemasonic religion. The use of a human effigy on a cross in the form of a scarecrow has been also used in many times also. In historic times, a human would be sacrificed and hung on a cross, just the way many churches of the Christian religion depicts it today, except they have it with Jesus Christ on the cross. See, Jesus Christ isn't on the cross anymore. He defeated it. Okay, but that's how the Catholics always want to portray Jesus, this pitiful, you know, person up on this cross that has to continually be re-crucified in order for their sins to be continually paid for. Because, evidently, they don't believe what Jesus Christ said, where he said, it is finished. They don't believe that. See, they have to go in every week and do their communion or whatever they do. And through the, and through the doctrine of, of transubstantiation, they believe, and the priests are taught, that they have the power to actually turn the, the, the bread and the wine literally into the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every single time they, they believe they have that power. And I mean literal. They have to continually uh, keep doing this ritual over and over again to atone for their sins. Plus, they've got to go to confession, and they've got to keep the seven sacraments and all the other stuff the catechism teaches them. Because they're, they're trying to earn their way to heaven. Well, that's an abomination and an affront to God. Jesus Christ said when he was on the cross, you know, when it was all over, he said, it is finished. You know, have got to keep re-crucifying him. And he's not on the cross anymore. He's seated at the, at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, ever making intercession for the saints. Okay, so, that's how the Catholics, though, want to, want to depict him. One of them, anyways. Or they have him as a little baby Jesus with Goddess Mary. Another abomination. He's not a baby anymore. Yeah, Doug, Doug just told me about this painting that, um, would you have it on your wall at home? No. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> he, he had it in the book, he threw the book away but in this particular painting it shows little Jesus in a little manger scene and Mary's just gently lifting his foot and putting it on the serpent's head while he's in the manger <laughs> but see the, what's, the, what's, the, uh, what's the message the message is Jesus has to have Mary's help to do you know anything, and then that was that way since infancy until even now, where where she is considered by the Catholic Church the co-redemptrix. I mean, you got to go through her and Jesus in order to get saved. In fact, it's more important to go through her because she's the only one that can placate her son. That's what they're taught. I've seen pictures in this Baltimore Catechism where that's how he's portrayed. It shows this Jesus. He's on his like his throne. He's he's mad. He's like uh, has his fists and he's he's slamming them down against the side of the throne chair. And Mary's there in front of him trying to calm him down. And so if they go through Mary, that's the only way they can calm down Jesus. That's what they're taught. Hey, that's enough to get him into hell, if you think about it. Isn't that the devil's goal with all this? Just get you to hell? He don't really care how he does it, as long as he gets you there. So, in historic times, a human would be sacrificed and hung on a cross, just the way that many churches in the Christian religion depict it today. The sacrifice would later be chopped up to pieces. His blood and pieces of flesh were widely distributed and buried to encourage crop fertility. So this is pure witchcraft, what we're talking about here. 